students will find some of this familiar. I don't talk about my research in class, but I, I do talk about cosmology because I love to talk about it. When you talk about view from data, from astronomical images, from databases, to me, without any exception, the most beautiful ideas that come out of science are those that tell us the nature of the universe that we live in, give us some indication of our place in the universe. To understand, I mean, it's just the very concept, to understand the universe in some way that makes the universe make sense. Uh, it just seems uh, miraculous almost. This is a history of some of the uh, most important events in our understanding of the universe. Uh, in 1924, uh, surprisingly to most people, in 1920s, early 1920s, we did not know that other galaxies existed. <coughs> a lot of astronomers, and one very important one, Carl Schaeffler, believed that everything in the universe was contained within the Milky Way galaxy. Then <coughs> Hubble in 1924 showed that that's not so. In 1929, he published his famous Hubble's Law, which is the single most important factual thing about the universe that's ever been determined. He didn't know what this meant. He just knew it was important. In 1930, Sir Arthur told him what it meant. It means that space is expanding. That we live in a universe in which the space, the amount of space, is continuously increasing. In the late 40s and early 50s, a physicist, a cosmologist named George Gamow, that well, space is expanding and its expansion is governed by the general theory of relativity, then we ought to be able to work this backwards. And the most logical consequence of running expansion backwards is that there's less and less and less space in the universe. So what Gamal and earlier a priest named George Lamatra had concluded is that the universe had a beginning in time. It wasn't eternal as virtually all scientists believed at the time. And not only did it have a beginning in time, but that beginning was a very, very hot, very, very dense, but fortunately expanding and cooling state of matter. Uh, there were two predictions, well, there were lots of predictions, but there were two really important ones that came from this. And one of them was the prediction of the cosmic background radiation. I'm going to talk about that in a lot more. Uh, this cosmic background radiation has been studied by satellites because it's in the microwave region, that is the uh, region of the electromagnetic spectrum that our atmosphere blocks out. So when we want to study this, we want to take images of it, pictures of it. We have to do it with satellites that are above the atmosphere. Uh, this was the first of the important satellites. This is the last so far. There'll be another one in the near future to study that background radiation. In between 1998, a very remarkable discovery that the expansion of space is not slowing down, it's actually speeding up. Very, very contrary to what everybody believed at that time. Okay. Hubble's law, <coughs> observational fact, there's no theory here whatsoever. You measure the light is coming from a distant galaxy, you measure its wavelength. And if its wavelength is longer than it's expected to be, that's called red shift. Uh, and he uh, was the first person to able to measure the distances of the galaxy. So he was able to show for the first time that the amount of the red shift was directly proportional to the distance. That is, the more distant a distant galaxy was from us, the light that we received from it in our telescopes was more and more spread out in direct proportion. Didn't know what this meant, but he knew it was important. The person who did know what it meant when he heard about it was Sir Arthur Eddington. And the reason that he knew about it was Sir Arthur Eddington was an expert in Einstein's general theory of relativity. And in 1916, Einstein had actually realized that the general theory of relativity meant that space had to either be expanding or contracting. Unfortunately for him, he believed this was false. And he back, tried to back away from that prediction. Here's the sequence of events. Einstein tries to fit.
fix his theory. He tries to fix it by adding a cosmological constant. We'll talk about that later. Others show that his fix was not a fix. Whether the cosmological constant was there or not made no difference whatsoever. If the general theory of relativity in either of its forms was correct, space had to be either expanding or contracting. But theoretically, either could be true. Which was true was actually an observational problem. And what Eddington realized was that Hubble's law was actually the observational evidence that space was actually expanding. When Einstein heard about this, he called it is not accepting the prediction in the first place, the greatest blunder of the scientific career. We now know that it may not have been the greatest blunder of the scientific career, that it might have been just a very, very lucky uh, happenstance. It now appears as if the cosmological constant should have been there all along. Remarkable discovery points to that. Uh, George Gamow is considered the uh, first person to use ideas about the early universe to actually make predictions. We followed up on some earlier ideas that as we go back in time, there's less and less and less and less space. The density of the universe is greater and greater and greater. And according to the general theory of relativity, this cannot go back an infinite amount of time. There has to be a time when you wind up with zero space in the universe. And that has to be considered the beginning of the universe. Uh, this was not a very popular idea in science. Uh, for one uh, reason, is it was somewhat tainted by the possibility that it was more religious in origin than in uh, scientific in origin. Because, of course, many people uh, of faith believe that the universe did have a beginning in time, whereas almost all scientists believe that it did not. 